The northwest coast of America. 2,000 miles of rugged coast from Northern California to Alaska, blanketed by dense fogs and heavy rainforests. The area had a highly distinctive culture in Aboriginal times. Remote and inaccessible, the region between Puget Sound and Alaska retained the purest elements of this culture. The many Indian tribes along this coast spoke different languages, but their customs and their art forms were basically similar. This was a region of abundance. On the land, the Indians found game and vegetal foods, but their richest bounty was harvested from the sea. In swift dugout canoes, they hunted seals and sea lions. From larger canoes, one group of tribes even harpooned whales. In the inlets and streams, they caught salmon, halibut, and ulican, or candlefish and many other kinds of fish. On the tidal beaches, they gathered shellfish and seaweed. This natural abundance provided leisure to develop an extraordinary art. The weaving of baskets, mats and blankets, painting, and especially fine wood carving. From the dense forests of this coast, they took an inexhaustible supply of red and yellow cedar excellent material for immense plank houses, great canoes, and elaborately carved masks and boxes, and totem poles. The totem pole originated on the northwest coast. Here it remains unique, and the most spectacular example of the woodcarver's art. Though poles were carved by all the coastal tribes of British Columbia and southeastern Alaska, those of the Kwakutl and the Haida are probably the most famous. They were not objects of worship, but were erected to display the social crests of great men and noble families. Totem poles and house posts are of seven types. House posts, either plain or carved, supported the two central beams of each massive communal house. Crests, symbolizing the mythological tales or memorable events of the family, are displayed in these carvings, which are in the center of the house. Each post might carry its own separate chronicle, or a single tradition might continue in the carvings of all four posts. If the posts remained uncarved, they were often faced with separate carved slabs. However, no examples of these are left today. The house post was probably the oldest type of column. Being short, it could be carved easily with the older tools of stone, shell, and antler. Posts were often beautifully inlaid with shell. Some were decorated with human hair and ermine, though none of these decorations remain today. The mortuary pole was erected in honor of the dead. His ashes might repose in a crypt hollowed out in the back of the pole, or the pole might support a box carrying the body or the cremated remains. A totemic ancestor of the deceased was always represented on a mortuary pole. Of equal antiquity is the memorial pole. In the north, it was erected in front of the house of the deceased. 
Only in the Kwakutl area, and then after about 1880, were they erected in the cemeteries. The memorial pole was raised in honor of the deceased and served the same purpose as our modern tombstone, though it was usually placed some distance from the burial site. Within a year after the death of a man of prestige, his successor was obliged to erect a pole in memory of the man whose rights, privileges, and property he had inherited. The successor was usually a nephew in accordance with the matrilineal system of most of these tribes. The house frontal pole, a typically Haida form, was first observed on Langara, one of the Queen Charlotte Islands, in 1790. It was usually placed in the middle of the house front. Often an oval hole in the bottom figure served as the doorway. The Haida house frontal pole was usually surmounted by two or three high-hatted human figures serving as lookouts. It usually carried the totem of the wife as well as that of the husband. It appears that in ancient times, slaves were sometimes killed and placed in the hole just before a totem pole was erected. If this was done, an inverted head or the inverted figure of a man was sometimes carved on the pole. The heraldic pole originally a short, broad pole, became taller and more stately as time went on. Always beautifully carved and painted, the heraldic pole is really a family tree. It is a freestanding pole and is typically a quacutal form. The term potlatch pole has been applied to poles erected by newly rich commoners with no other purpose than to have a place in potlatch proceedings. It is a confusing term because the placing of any pole called for a potlatch, an occasion of feasting and distributing wealth. The ridicule or shame pole has entirely disappeared. It used to be carved to downgrade someone of high rank who had failed to meet a real or alleged obligation. It depicted the debtor or his totem in some uncomplimentary manner. Only by purchasing and destroying it could the slight be rectified. The frog was the totem of the chief of the Kiksadi clan of the Tlingit tribe. This ancient depicting three fat frogs was fuel the Kiksadi because their chief refused to pay a debt involving three Kiksadi women and three slaves belonging to another chief. <laughs> The high development of wood carving on the northwest coast stemmed from the complex social system of these tribes with their respect for prestige. Great stress was laid on systems of kinship and inheritance and on relative rank validated by displays of wealth. There were, in general, three classes of people the nobility, the commoners, and the slaves. Among the Tsimshian, there was even a fourth class, that of the hereditary chiefs. Originally, the right to make such an ostentatious display of crests and other symbols of rank was limited to the chiefs and the very high nobility. Their wealth made this possible. They alone could afford to have totem poles erected in their honor. With the coming of the fur trade, wealth became more plentiful, and soon those of lower rank came to enjoy a condition of opulence. Next came the vast fishing and canning industries. Soon, even the commoners were able to erect totem poles, give potlatches, and display their newly acquired riches. By the first quarter of the 19th century, some villages had very many poles. By 1880, the erection of poles by the Haida, the most prolific carvers, had almost ceased. The Kwakutl put up most of their poles after 1880, and the Tsimshian between 1900 and 1980. <laughs>
the selecting and felling of a tall cedar tree. After the bark is removed, the log is floated to the village for carving. The tools used on the northwest coast in pre-contact times were made with blades of stone, shell, or antler. Although small amounts of iron were obtained by aboriginal trade and from pieces of wreckage cast up on the beaches. Using mostly non-metal tools, carving was slow, not elaborate, and probably only small poles were attempted. With the extensive introduction of iron by white explorers and fur traders, almost all tools were made with metal cutting edges, though the forms of the old tools were retained. The elbow adze with the curved lip is a modern type adopted in recent years. The changeover to metal edge tools gave a great surge to Northwest Coast art and led to the carving of taller and more elaborate poles. Soon the shorter types attached to house fronts or others used as memorial poles grew to heights of 60 or even 80 feet. Today, there are only a few traditional carvers left, engaged primarily in duplicating some of the old, poorly preserved poles. One of these carvers was Mungo Martin, Nakapankum, a high-ranking chief of the Kwakutl. Most carving is done at Thunderbird Park in Victoria under the sponsorship of the Provincial Museum of British Columbia. The design is sketched and the forms are carved from the single straight-grained log. A man seldom, if ever, carved his own pole. Instead, he hired others, usually a chief of another clan, who supervised the carving of the pole. When an outstretched wing or an unusually long beak was added, as for Thunderbird or Raven, it was carved separately, mortised, and doweled into place. Another of the very few remaining Quakutal carvers is Henry Hunt, a grandson of George Hunt, the famous informant of Franz Boas. On the earlier totem poles, only the essential features, such as eyes, ears, and mouths, were painted. 
Pigments were mixed with crushed salmon roe and applied with brushes of porcupine hair. The raising of very tall poles would probably have been impossible in ancient times. A pole of 40 or 50 feet was extreme for that period and putting it up presented difficulties. The raising was begun by lifting the pole with log levers and prop. When it reached a sufficient angle, it was pulled into place by means of a long line passed over a horizontal beam. Its base, lying in a trench and braced against a slab, was eased into a hole about six feet deep. The hole was filled with earth and firmly tamped. The pole usually stood about 80 years before its base rotted and it fell to the ground. The tallest pole ever carved stands in Beacon Hill Park in Victoria. It rises 127 feet 7 inches and was carved by Mungo Martin and his associates. Its elaborate carvings depict the legend of Geeksum, one of the first men of the Kwakutl tribe, who is said to have been created on the north shore of Vancouver Island. Early one morning, Geeksum saw a great pole rising vertically out of the beach. Each figure was alive and making its characteristic cry. He was told, observe carefully all these figures on the pole. These will be your crests to be displayed by you and your descendants. Geeksum saw his own image on the base of the pole wearing a neck ring of red cedar bark, an emblem of special significance in the winter ceremonial. He also carefully observed hohok, the cannibal bird, and killer whale, eagle, beaver, and others. Understanding the totem pole requires familiarity with the aesthetic of the Northwest Coast Indians. They abhor vacant spaces in painting and textiles even more than in wood carving. Their art, because it was based upon the portrayal of mammals, birds, and other living forms derived from those met in everyday life, is primarily realistic. Perspective was not attempted. Symbolism, however, was highly important. One or more salient characteristics of each animal were always shown and these came to symbolize the species. In totem poles which were based upon mythological stories, these designs were mnemonic. They suggested the myth. Only to one familiar with the legendary history of the tribe are such designs fully meaningful. To such a person, a single figure or characteristic may conjure up a whole story. Totem poles were made to be viewed from the front. The back was seldom carved or decorated, though it was often hollowed out. The figures carved on totem poles came from the myths and traditions of the people, and many were used as crests. These figures have conventionalized and often exaggerated features, which serve as symbols to identify them. Beak forms identify birds. Eagle has a large curved beak with its point turned downward and high slanting nostrils. Thunderbird also has the turned down beak, but differs from eagle by having curled horns on top of his head. Raven has an excessively large straight beak. Hohok, the mythical bird who breaks men's skulls, has an even longer beak, which is sometimes mechanized to make a clacking sound. Mammals are identified by having ears on the tops of their heads. Bear is easily distinguished by his large paws, ears, and a large mouth set with teeth. Killer whale's most prominent feature is a tall dorsal fin with a white spot. Large incisors and a scaly tail identify beaver. Zonokwa was a wild woman of the woods who stole children and ate them. Her features 
are hollow cheeks and protruding lips. Sisiutl, the two-headed horned serpent, appears with his teeth bared and tongue extended. To touch or even see him means sure death. These are some of the crests and their identifying features. But there was also a bewildering variety of other figures and symbols, since clan members could utilize any character or incident in the clan's traditions. The carver was depicting, in a very real way, the actions of supernatural beings endowed with both human and animal attributes. He made these forms highly realistic, but never omitted the symbolic features. The carver's realism even goes so far that he often mechanizes certain parts, especially in masks. These movable parts are operated by cords to animate the figure. One feature of special interest is the use of the eye motif. In addition to the natural eyes of the animal, other eyes, or occasionally faces, were added to the figure, accentuating special parts. Sometimes the eye symbol appears out toward the tips of feathers. Such eyes are said to indicate special sensitivity and perception wherever they occur. It is virtually impossible for an outsider to fully interpret totem poles. The carver had a limitless choice of characters and few rules to govern him. An observer might recognize a character such as Raven but he could not know which one of the many stories about Raven was being represented. The interlocking, often grotesque figures on an elaborate pole may have esoteric or hidden meaning to the owner and his clan, but they have no religious significance. Totem poles are, in fact, cedar monuments to the person or family for whom they were carved. Bearing his totemic symbols and depicting mythological incidents in the legendary history of his family, a pole added great honor and prestige to the person for whom it was erected. Very few totem poles still stand on the old village sites. The moist climate, which nurtures the tall cedars, also erodes the carved monuments made from cedar, causing them to rot away. Fortunately, many fine old poles have been saved and are now in museums and special collections, like those at Victoria and Vancouver in British Columbia and at Ottawa in eastern Canada. Not only have these original poles been preserved, but replicas of many of the finest have been made by such carvers as Mungo Martin. From the time of early contact, the totem pole has been the outstanding feature of the Northwest Coast, with Thunderbird its most distinguished figure. At least once, possibly several times during his life, a man of rank would give a potlatch. On acquiring a new crest, a chief might invite many tribes to his village. feasting and dancing, and he would make a long speech recounting his ancestry and family importance. This is the house of Mungo Martin, Nakapankum, in Thunderbird Park, Victoria, Vancouver Island. He has invited a group of his Kwakutl tribesmen for feasting and dancing, as in ancient times. Nakapankum recounts the origin of one of his crests. It is the story of Hohok, the cannibal bird who ate men's brains, and how he became a crest in the old Nakapankum's house. One day, a great chief, Yaikolalasami, went bear hunting. When he had been away four days, he saw Hohok, this fabulous bird, and heard his cry. <laughs> 
Ohop was larger than a man. The chief was frightened and hid. Finally, Ohop found him hiding at one side of a cedar tree. Ohok tried to peck the chief with his great beak, but missed him. Yaiko Lalasami merely jumped to the other side of the cedar tree, and Hohok could not kill him. The great chief came home and carved Hohok out of yellow cedar and placed him on top of a pole at his house. Later on, the old Nakapankum, a great chief of the Kwakutl, wanted to have Hohok carved as a crest. He found that he could obtain the right to use Hohok only by marrying the daughter of the chief, who then owned this right. He married this daughter, and today, Hohok is the topmost figure of the house posts of both of the Kapankum's great houses. types. House posts, either plain or carved, supported the two central beams of each massive communal house. Crests, symbolizing the mythological tales or memorable events of the family, are displayed in these carvings, which are in the center of the house. Each post might carry its own separate chronicle, or a single tradition might continue in the carvings of all four posts. If the posts remained uncarved, they were often faced with separate carved slabs. The area had a highly distinctive culture in Aboriginal times. Remote and inaccessible, the region between Puget Sound and Alaska retained the purest elements of this culture. The many Indian tribes along this coast spoke different languages but their customs and their art forms were basically similar. This was a region of abundance. On the land, the Indians found game and vegetable foods, but their richest bounty was harvested from the sea. In swift dugout canoes, they hunted seals and sea lions. From larger canoes, one group of tribes even harpooned whales. In the inlets and streams, they caught salmon, halibut, and ulican, or candlefish, and many other kinds of fish. On the tidal beaches, they gathered shellfish and seaweed. This natural abundance provided leisure to develop an extraordinary art. The weaving of baskets, mats and blankets, painting, and especially fine wood carving. From the dense forests of this coast, they took an inexhaustible supply of red and yellow cedar, excellent material for immense plank houses, great canoes, and elaborately carved masks and boxes, and... The Northwest Coast of America. 2,000 miles of rugged coast from Northern California to Alaska, blanketed by dense fogs and heavy rainforests. 
The totem pole originated on the northwest coast. Here it remains unique and the most spectacular example of the woodcarver's art. Though poles were carved by all the coastal tribes of British Columbia and southeastern Alaska, those of the Kwakutl and the Haida are probably the most famous. They were not objects of worship, but were erected to display the social crests of great men and noble families. Yeah. 